Next up, we have Alexei Ahovnov from Ethereum 1X, who's going to be talking about Starks for stateless clients. Um, the stateless client paradigm is one of the approaches to erase the pressure of ever-growing available state. And he's going to explore problems, explore the problem this, this approach solves, and how Stark proofs could be used in the process. So welcome to the stage. Thank you. Is this mic? Okay. Yeah, so um, to start with, I would say that um, after this talk, at some point, I will turn this into the, the like textual version of it, because at the moment there's only pictures, and I hope you will appreciate that. Uh, there's not much text in there. All right, so first of all, we're going to start with the... Um, I'm not going to uh, go from far. Let's just go get straight to the... The, the business, because I want to maybe leave some some time for the questions. So um, well some of you might might familiar with Ethereum. So let's imagine that we have a genesis uh, in Ethereum, which consists of three accounts, and each of them is loaded with a certain amount of ether. You can see one of them is nine e e ether, and another one, some others has a fractional amount of ether. And so for the first, so I'm going to be doing a lot of visual adjustments here to, to make you see better. So uh, there's a number of them. The first one I'm going to do is that I'm going to um, shorten the, this key. So you're on the left side, you can see that how the, um, the, the complete keys look like. So essentially here we have a branch of, with the three, uh, with the, with the three uh, so, so branch node with the three branches on the top, and then you've got uh, three these hanging uh, keys. So why is the colors? So um, some of you might know that in Ethereum they use a um, hexadecimal uh, representation for the uh, for the keys, and each uh, the, uh, each um, uh, uh, square in here it represents a, a different number from zero to fifteen. So that's one sixteen colors. So but these these. Uh, these keys are quite long, so they will uh, get in the way, so we're going to shorten them. So we skip part of the key. So that's the first adjustment. So then, um, then I will demonstrate to you what happens if we um, make a transaction which sends, uh, you know, 1,000 of the Ether to an, an a fresh account. So what you might notice is that uh, instead of three accounts, we now have five accounts, and they still um, are connected to the same branch node. And so one of them is a miner who just uh, earned two Ether. Um, so the sender got some deducted from its account, and the receiver got some extra. So and then you see the new account uh, appeared. So then um, we decide to send another uh, thousand, uh, thousand of ether to the same recipient. You see, the structure of the state does not really change, but the only thing that changes is the leaf. So you see, the miner got another two ether, and the receiver got some extra ether. And then obviously there will be some transaction fees, but they're quite small, so you can't see them here. Right. Next, we're going to do something more interesting. So on the left-hand side, you can see a very simplistic um, token contract in Solidity, which doesn't have mo uh, all of the functions, like transfer from, approve, and all this kind of stuff, because I just wanted to minimize the code. But all it has is mint and transfer. So basically, the, the minter can mint uh, any, any number of tokens to another address, and the transfer, like any, anybody could transfer them. So when we compile it with the Solidity, with the latest comp Solidity compiler, we see uh, just under a kilobyte of bytecode, which is basically that big square with uh, lots of colors. So you like, appreciate how big it is. Like This is basically like uh, 800 bytes or something. And then you can see that there's a dress of the miner appears somewhere there. So essentially what, what this diagram is showing is that there is this new account with one with zero ether in it, which uh, has uh, some other bits attached to it. So apart from the nones, nones, which is the first number, number one, and the ether balance, you also have two other things now. You have a code attached, and you also have a, a storage. So this account now starts to have storage. And the storage, as you can see, is now start, starts as just one thing, but it will later grow into its own tree. So next thing we do is, uh, again, we, we apply the visual adjustment again. So we don't want to be uh, wasting space for these huge uh, blobs of code. So we're going to compress them into the like a smaller representation to still let you know that there's a code there, but you're not really interested in what is inside. So it's just a, another adjustment. And then we do another adjustment. So instead of staring at this long address, which is currently the, uh, essentially this address is essentially a number, is a, for the, 
for the purpose of this discussion is simply a number which happens to be equal to some address of the minter. But you know, you just see that this is a big number, so we can press it as well. We just use the ellipses to uh, put it in the middle. Um, so now, let's now uh, uh, do something with this contract. We mint uh, 10 tokens. Um, and so what happens is that uh, you get in the storage, instead of one, you now have three elements. And so you've got a gr you, the, the tree of the storage starts growing. And so you can have a total supply. You might remember in the code that we had a total supply field, which is the, on the left. And then we have minted 10 tokens, which is 0, 8 in hexadecimal. And that's now another storage item. So we have three now. Now, now we're going to do the transfer of three tokens from one account to another, obviously from the minter, because it's the only account which has tokens at the moment. And so what you could see there is that the owner of these tokens is shown by the by the red uh, arrows you can see that they are kind of um, you know you can see that they are spent some ether on the transaction fee uh, but they're not like in, in any way shown in the storage of the contract that's because because of uh, the how currently all the ERC20 tokens work but you can see now that the total supply stays the same but you now have uh, tokens split between two uh, different uh, accounts so now you can see the storage is now becoming much more interesting. So let's now do it on scale, on, on, on mass. Uh, I hope that you, you could still appreciate the scale. So now uh, we forget about tokens for a moment and we uh, create 32 transactions that uh, all send uh, 1,000 of Ether to different addresses, which is generated the addresses randomly and just uh, send some Ether. You could see now that we have uh, quite a few accounts in a tree and you see on the right hand side you start interesting structure starts forming when you have like not just the, the things hanging out but you have a multiple branch nodes you have some nesting of the branching and this is what uh, people call Patricia Merkle tree it's kind of starts becoming more interesting and so here I'm going to do another visual adjustment so I found in practice when I was uh, preparing this visualization then that the diagrams becoming really wide and obviously for the purposes of the pr uh, presentation they're just becoming so wide it becomes impractical to see them because of the this number 16 so everything is just branching so wildly so instead i'm going to say okay i'm going to switch our tries to uh, uh to qu quad quad tries so instead of 16 we we're going to use number four and the reason for that is because we're still preserving this so it's still uh, bigger than two, which will be binary trees. And I consider binary trees as a special case. So it's still uh, bigger than two, but it's not as big as the diagrams become like uh, really, really uh, wide. And I also noticed that uh, when, you when you choose the number four, um, you also start seeing uh, more, more interesting features in your try. For example, you may notice that at some level, um, you um, unfortunately I don't have a pointer, but Around here, oh, oh sorry. Um, so around here, uh, just up where I'm, where I'm standing, you see these uh, three things, three uh, nodes, and if you look on the on the top of them, there's a little uh, blue dot over there. So this blue dot is called a um, e extension node. What's that? Oh, the pointer. Sorry. Thank you. So you see this blue dot dot. This is actually another special case in Patricia tree, which is called extension node, which is basically like the way of compressing these little long uh, stretches. But uh, so in here we don't have them because uh, we, in order to get to this kind of feature, we need uh, to have at least thousand accounts, and so that's why this uh, visual uh, uh, adjustment uh, pays off. So this is actually now a bit magnified, so I can tell, uh, I can show you that little thing again, this little feature. And actually, there's another one here, right? So, and of course, you can see there's a four colors only. So it's easier to work with uh, because people kind of remember, they don't remember 16 things, but they can remember four things. Um, so now uh, let's do another interesting thing. We're going to deploy a new token. So you see, this is our old token contract with the our, uh, I think we did something with it again. But anyway, I uh, no, no, this is our old tokens, which has the set three and seven. And now we're going to deploy the new one, which is going to be here with the same code, but with a much larger storage. And it's because we actually not just deployed it, but we also sent 
uh, uh, one token to 32 different uh, token uh, uh, recipients. And that's why we see how the storage has grown out of here. Like it's another big tree. Okay, so what are we going to do next? Okay, so then we're going to send another, just to, to so th this is where we're going to get to the interesting concept, which is I call block proof. Uh, so we now imagine that we have this as a base, right? So this is our, this has happened, like all these transactions and block happened, and this is where we now arrived at a certain block number. So what is going to happen next is, uh, is where we're going to start applying the stateless clients. So imagine that in our block that we are now concerned with, that we are going to propagate, uh, there's only two things happening. There's two transactions. One of them sends uh, 1,000, sorry, 1,000 of Ether to a, in one of the existing addresses, and the second transaction sends one token. And I can point out to you, so this goes from the 12 to the 13. There, like, this is not the only places where it changes. For example, here you notice uh, what changed is the, uh, the amount here. So we sent, uh, to send extra Ether to this account. So that's here. So then th here what changes is that uh, the miner m earned another two uh, Ether, although there wasn't, it wasn't a party in any transaction. So here you could see that we sent one token, and that's uh, changed uh, the storage of, the, of our contract. And here, where was it? There was a nonce somewhere. I can't see it. Um, no, I think I didn't show all the changes. Okay, but you can basically see that there are some parts of the tr this big tree that they change it, but most of the tree does not change at all, right? So the idea of the stateless client is that what if we are we are going to somehow only show, like we pr we somehow compile the list of changes that have happened, and somehow prove that these uh, these things that we are pointing out to you actually uh, belonging to this big tree. So this is exactly what I call the block proof. So what I did here is you could see that in the, these, uh, these uh, things that are like little uh, rows of uh, uh, quad digits, they used to be like that, but now some of them are large. And what are they? these things? So in this particular block with two transactions, we have touched a f only a few accounts, and all of them are shown with the large uh, things. So we, sh we, we touched this account, that one, that one. So about five accounts here, and then we touched uh, two um, storage items of this contract because we sent the token from one uh, uh, to another because supply didn't change. So we've got two changes here. And we've got one, two, three, four, five changes. And why is this five? Because one of them is a miner, one of them is a uh, sender, one of them re is receiver for the ETH transaction, but then another one is the sender for the token transaction and, uh, and, uh, and the contract itself as well. Yeah, so th this is the contract itself, you can see. So essentially, but why do we have these things included as well? So essentially, you might, uh, you might uh, already guessed what I've done here. So this is the root of our try. And only the things that we are kind of, uh, that are changing in this block are, are included into our block proof. Everything else is kind of rolled into these hashes, right? And this is where we are, instead of the showing the entire tree, we just show the bits. The reason why we also have to carry around these things, which are seemingly unrelated, is because, um, so what I've discovered when I looked at the uh, the code of um, these operations with the Patricia Merkle tree, let's say in, in the Go Ethereum and then in Turbogeth, is that the deletion operation in Patricia tree is a bit tricky. Uh, because when you delete things, let's say that you uh, have a branch node with two elements here. Actually, let's take this one. So this is the branch node with two elements. If you happen to delete this one later on for some reason, then this one becomes an, like a non-branch node and you have to collapse it. You have to merge this key with this one and then after that this is going to become uh, one. So you have to merge these two things and then make some transformation here. So and it, ha it, it turns out that if we did not uh, present this thing together, then the next operation could have deleted that thing and then we needed a bit more, more data to fetch. So essentially, inclusion of these extra things ensures that whatever operation is going to happen on this block proof 
it we will always be able to handle it without requesting more data. So this makes the block proof complete, meaning that any transaction which touches the data will be a will be executed. Doesn't matter if it's inserting or deleting or or just simply reading it. So now the uh, this the so now I'm going to explain you the uh, the the general idea of the stateless client. So currently we have uh, the full nodes in the Ethereum network are supposed to have a copy of the state, like the, the things that we looked at before, like this large thing, right? And then by, by having the copy of the state, they can then execute transactions and know what the transactions are reading and what they're writing. And, the comp and then they arrive at the next uh, version of the state and they hash it and they compare the root of that hash to the what is it in the header. So now what if we, uh, and the problem of course with that is that if the state is really large, then it becomes uh, harder and harder to keep it in a such a way that you can efficiently access it. So your cache is getting full and stuff like that. So what we're going to, in, in a stateless client uh, idea, is that uh, instead of requiring that everybody has this state, uh, somebody, just it, it's enough just for one um, participant in the network to produce such a block proof for every block and ship it, I mean, to gossip it around the network together with the blocks. So then everybody who receives block and the block proof will be able to execute the entire block because they have all the data available in here. If this is enough to execute the entire block, they will be able to verify that the data that you got are actually hashing to the uh, correct root. And they will also be able to verify that after the execution, they just rehash the tree and then you will get the root in the uh, in the header, and that's it. That's it. So, the great idea, right? Okay, but there must be a catch, of course. Nothing. Uh, so before we get to the catch, so now uh, let's go a bit uh, into more details. So here, um, so here is we got the uh, how we're gonna like do. Let's say that we want to send them around. What is gonna be our payload for this kind of tree? So uh, this is what I currently arrived at. So we're splitting this block proof into four parts. So uh, the obviously the keys and the values that we have. Then we have some hashes, also like a list. Then we have the codes, which I currently think we're not going to be able to uh, to do statelessly. And then we have this, which is uh, some kind of instruction in some weird uh, assembly language. Um, so I will show you uh, pretty quickly how this assembly language works. So essentially, we start with the first instruction and it tells us to take one uh, uh, key and value and put it on a stack. And then we move to the next instruction. Again, we do the leaf. So the, this number tells, it tells us how many digits to take from the, from the, uh, the key. So then we move out the stack. We s then we create the branch node with the 0, 3, which will be our uh, you will see, so this is the zero 03. So in our quote notation, uh, white is the zero, blue is the three. And we keep moving. And then we basically compress it as a hash. So we hash that little subtree and then hash it. So then we keep going. And eventually, uh, the, the more, more things are getting added to the stack. And then we get more branches and blah, blah, blah. And so eventually, you might get that we eventually, when, th when we run out of through all this program, we on the stack we will have a root of the our tree. So this is the way we're going to verify that our and so on. And eventually you will just have one item on the stack, which will be the uh, the, the hash, and everything else has to be empty. Okay. Now I've done the experiment. I've implemented uh, similar things, not exactly that thing, but very similar, which actually worked. It I managed to uh, uh, process. I, I generated block proofs for all the blocks on Ethereum up to until like 7.2 million. And I measured how big they would be, and this is actually the the moving average of uh, uh, of uh, with a window of thousand blocks. Because uh, I I hope to smooth out this this these lines. So as you can see that the there's a, a one m megabyte line is about here. So you see that they are actually just getting over one megabyte in a, on average. Individual ones could actually go much higher. So, but what you can also see that the biggest part of them are, are these hashes, the intermediate hashes, which you saw in orange. And so, so this is where I'm suggesting to use the stack proofs to be able to compress them. So you can see the one megabyte, and we know that the stack proofs could be uh, something uh, on the order of, let's say, uh, 40 kilobytes or 60 kilobytes. And you can also see that the remaining bits are 
the contract codes. That's why I'm saying that I suggest in a way we're not making them stateless yet, so to chop this up. And the remaining things, which are the yellow and the blue things, they're on order of, let's say, 60 kilobytes, which is comparable to the, the Stark proof. So in the Stark, if we wanted to generate the Stark proof of this computation, we just basically have uh, these four things uh, represented as inputs, as auxiliary input, and uh, and so this would need to be open so that you make sure that uh, the, these things are all hashed into the tree, and this is uh, this is basically a hidden input. So because we compress it away, and this is where. Uh, this is just initial idea because I'm not expert in Starks, so but I'm inviting people to help me with that. Is uh, I'm just suggesting the this kind of specific. Uh, I'm, I don't think I'm going to have time for this. Uh, so I'm suggesting the specific architecture for how we can run this computation that I just showed you with a stack on as a, as a Stark uh, uh, is basically the polynomial Stark construction. And I think I'm going to finish here. Uh, Thank you very much. Are there any questions? The mics are here and here, if you have any. Go ahead. I think there was a question over there. Oh, there's a microphone right there. Is that OK? If you just... I, I can ask Juan Manuel. OK. Uh, do you have the numbers? Like, those numbers are without any um, I would say caching. Do you have also caching mechanism so that if you remember some op some witness that or some block witness or uh, block proof that you received in the past, I don't know, 1,024 blocks, then maybe the the total witness is smaller. Uh, yes, I did have uh, experiments like that. So I I experimented with number 256, which is basically if you expect if you assume that people are storing the state, the part of the state that has been touched in a recent uh, 256 blocks, then that allows you on average, again on average, to reduce the size of the proof by the factor of three. Um, but um, this is still quite unreliable, I would say. Um, the question is about the, the code that you mentioned that you would like to make stateless yet, which means that you're just planning that it will be distributed as a uh, full code between all the nodes, or? So I'm basically uh, suggesting that uh, as for the first step, we assume that all the full nodes will have the will keep the entire code of all deployed smart contracts. Okay, thanks. Um, so do do I understand correctly that you're not actually planning to execute the um, the actual semantics of the transaction? Only check check that the hash was correctly calculated. No, no. The the idea is that you will execute the semantic of the transactions, but. Uh, uh, given the block proof, you will never need to go into some kind of database for the state because everything that you need for this execution is in front of you in the block proof. I, I see. And just in indicatively, do, what is the ratio of the um, of the co computationally to how much you spend on um, uh, verifying the transaction compared to verifying these um, these hashes? Where I'm going with this is maybe you want to use Starks to also verify the transaction semantics if it's a problem. Uh, it's much more ambitious. I think it. In theory, it's possible, but I, it's uh, basically. I, th I think at the moment, for me, it's too ambitious to do that. Uh. Cool. So I thank you thank very you. much for Bye. the talk.